So yeah. we've already yes. heard of the uh, Kim and Hubert love fest already. So we're pretty sick of that already. So welcome in, guys. Hope you're all good. Going to be talking about market makers and uh, what we're going to try and do is uh, uh, is, is re-engineer or reverse engineer or deconstruct the market makers world, try and understand a little bit about what they do and why they do what they do. And from an academic point of view, it's a very, very interesting pursuit. Probably the single most important pursuit that any trader can undertake is to understand the market makers and their objectives, how they play the markets, concepts like VPIN, arrival rates. These are the kind of concepts that we want to be talking about when we're talking about market makers. A lot of people talk about trading in terms of overbought and oversold conditions. There is no such thing as overbought and oversold. There is too cheap and too expensive, but overbought and oversold, yeah, maybe not quite the right terminology, but it's just in the terminology. That's precisely it. It's just in the terminology and the way you understand. So a very, very important part of trading is asking the right questions and having tools that answer those questions. But do you know what question it is you're asking? That's really the key to the whole environment of market makers. And if you don't know how the market makers play, how are you supposed to trade, considering that the vast majority of times you'll be trading against the market makers? So why would you be trading against the market maker? Because you're supposed to be trading against the market. Generally, as a rule, when you buy a market maker or sell, when you sell a market maker or buy it. So you get this idea. But it's not so much that they're on the other side of that deal. It's what they're doing with that deal. Great example, and forgive me for not having anything particularly prepared. So this was thrown together, and it looks as if it was thrown together in about two seconds flat. And you're right, it was thrown together two seconds flat just before we came in. A simple guy in a phone booth making a phone call to the floor, and he wants to buy 10 S&P at market. And the current market price that the guys on the floor are giving him is 46 bid, 47 offered, 46 bid, 47 offered. And he's buying 10 at market. So they come, come back and say, right, you got your 10 at 47. So he bought 10 at 47, the market order, obviously crossing the spread at 47. And then the next phone call comes through and it's Goldman's. Good old Mr. Goldman. And uh, Mr. Goldman and his, his little brother, Sachs, phones up and says, buy me 10 at market. The market maker goes off, bloody hell, it's that guy again. So he prices up 46.50. So you're looking at a price now, a bid offer spread, 46 bid, 50 offered. The guy wants to buy 10 and therefore he's getting filled at 50. Why did that happen and what can we understand about this? Well, the very, very simple concept and, uh, you know, apologies to the wee guy in the phone booth. I'm assuming he's not some high flying trader that, uh, but obviously he's got his, uh, he's got his, uh, he's got his muzzle on. So at that stage, obviously it's uh, maybe some sort of a, uh, some sort of voice recognition that he's trying to hide who he is. But if it's just Joe Public, the market maker is going to want that business all day, all night. They want as much of that business as they possibly can do. So and sometimes they'll actually give a good price. So this guy phones up and says, I want to buy 10 at market. The market maker says, well, maybe this guy's got a few more contracts to trade. I'll give you 46. The guy goes, 46? I'm looking at my, my iPhone here and I can see the price is 46, 47. So that's a great price. In fact, I'll buy another 10. Well, you give me 46. Well, this is getting better. I'm getting brilliant business here at 46. Well, you all know yourself probably from experience that if you get filled at 46 when it's playing 46, 47, you're going to lose money very, very soon indeed. And whereas when you get a bad fill, when any time you hear this horrible fill you get coming from your, from your broker, it's probably because you're on the right trade and they just don't want to give you it at a good price. So the better the fill, the worse the trade, the worse the fill, the better the trade. And that's obviously a little bit back to front for a lot of people, but it is just the reality of things. So what happens here? 10 at 50. So why did these widen the spread? Because the floor trader doesn't want those contracts. The floor trader recognized this guy here as having a little bit of inside knowledge. He's on the phone, of course, to to uh, Powell, of course, the most of the Federal Reserve made up, of course, of uh, people like Goldman Sachs's uh, uh, ex-staffers, of course. And obviously the idea that these guys have the hotline to the Federal Reserve, they know what's going on, they have the best information, the best intelligence, the best, the best PhDs, et cetera, et cetera. 
then you can understand that when the floor guy gets a call in and it's from Goldman's, they don't want to give them a great price. They want to give them a price because that's what they're paid to do. They're paid to make a two-way market, but they want to give them a price that gives them at least an opportunity. So obviously the guy could say, right, I'll, I'll do this deal at 50. And then obviously they've closed that trade off by putting the price up at 50 because Goldman's might say, you know, well, we're not going to buy any more at 50. So in other words, they've closed off the buy at 50. The price can now drop back down towards 46, 47, because that's what the market maker is now trying to do. What's the difference between these two people? It might just be in the name, but of course, what the difference is, is the concept of informed. You might have heard of the Monty Hall problem. Uh, many of you have came across it in films. For example, when you talk about card counting, you might remember the film about card counting uh, from the MIT crowd. Well, the Monty Hall problem came from that card counting, and a lot of people get this question wrong about what it is all about. They think it's about uh, always, 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 always switch. And you ask people the question, but why would you switch? What, what is it that causes you to switch from the Monty Hall problem? What's the real reason why you change during the Monty Hall problem to switch? Now, if you haven't seen the movie, you don't have a bloody clue what I'm talking about, and that's absolutely fine. It's not that important. But inside the idea of the Monty Hall problem, this is the basic idea of the Monty Hall here. You can see it for yourself. Monty Hall, it's this idea of no swap or swap. Do you swap your box or do you, do you hold on to the box that you, that's got the dollars in it? And the idea is the no swap has a one in three chance and the swap option has a two in three chance. But that's not actually 100% accurate. The whole point about the Monty Hall problem is based around this game show of swapping your box that has dollars in it for a box that hasn't got any dollars in it. The whole point about that is that the game show host opens a box once the game is underway. They open a box and you've now got a choice. And the game show host opens a box with nothing in it. Now you've got a choice. So in other words, you've got these options here. There's box one, box two, and box three. You've selected box one in both cases. In scenario A, box one has the dollars in it. In scenario B, box two has the dollars in it. In scenario C, box three has the dollars in it. If you decide to go with the no swap option and the game show host opens box zero and you don't swap, you stay with box A, then of course you win the thousand dollars or whatever is in the box. Under the same conditions, if you see this trade here, of course the money's in box two and therefore you have no dollars. You didn't swap, you've still got box one and you've not won any money. And then obviously in box C scenario as well, you can see that the same thing happens. You don't win any money. So you remain on box one, you do not swap and therefore you win one and three. You win one and three, the statistical odds of getting this right was one and three, so you haven't improved your probabilities. Well, inside the Monty Hall problem, which is, uh, as I said, it's explained in the film regarding the card counting. I can't remember what the film's called. But anyway, then in the film, you'll be able to recognize this idea of the swap option. And the swap option is box one, two, and three, exactly the same. You start out with box one, and that's got the dollars in it, and you swap, and they open box two, and you end up swapping for box three, and it's got no money in it. But if you swap on all the other occasions, you make money on both the other two occasions, which means you get a two and three probability. You actually end up with a two and three probability instead of a one and three. So when I ask this question to a lot of people, the immediate response, if they've seen the film, is swap always. Completely 100% wrong. Completely 100% wrong. Because you, at this stage, you don't know enough information. You're just saying swap because you've seen the movie. You're just saying buy because you've seen the movie, because you've seen the YouTube video, because you've seen the such and such. You don't actually know the reason why there's a buy at that stage, but you might as well buy it because there's an overbought stochastic or an oversold stochastic coming onto your screens. But you don't know why you're going to buy it. You don't really understand the game. The reason why the Monty Hall problem is a swap is not because it has an edge. 
It's because of the game show host opening a box that contains nothing in it. And therefore, the game show host would be determined to be an informed source of information. If the game show host, of course, had no information about what was in the box, there'd be a fairly good chance that the game show host would open a box that contained the money, and therefore the game show would be pretty crap. So if the game show host is known to know what's in the box, the Monty Hall problem becomes swap on all occasions. So it's not the concept that you're going to be swapping that's important. It's the concept of the informed trader that's important. Single most important element is the informed source. So why is that important? Why does this have any influence on us as traders? What relevance am I talking about here? Is it just to sound smart or is it have a genuine reason? Well, that's up to you to determine for yourself. But we would hope by the end of this little presentation that you'll be determining that that informed source is probably the single most important question that we as traders can ask about what's going on in the marketplace. When I look at this little comment at the bottom, you might be able to see it for yourself. I've taken a screenshot of a piece of a research paper. And uh, whilst it's not that important to understand exactly what it is, but we'll just read the important points here. The figure suggests a strong link between the magnitude of the overnight inventory costs and the volatility of price trajectories. As evident from the figure, managing inventory is more challenging when arrival rates are asymmetric. And the failure to do so effectively may result in large overnight positions. And it goes on to explain that those large overnight positions represent large overnight unmanageable, almost unmanageable risks. This question of arrival rate returns 47 times on this research paper, 47 times the concept of arrival rates is mentioned in this particular research paper. Now, why is this research paper of any use to us in line with the academic work that came from the Monty Hall problem? Well, the reason why this research paper is useful to us is because it's a research paper that is generated by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York staff report on intraday market making with overnight inventory costs. The Federal Reserve staff report on intraday market making. So therefore, this concept of arrival rate, asymmetrical arrival rate, really concerns the central banks. It really concerns the Fed as a, as a liquidity provider in some of the markets. It really concerns the Fed enough to write papers on it. And it really concerns the Fed because, of course, when we talk about things like the flash crash, it became very apparent to us that when we saw the flash crash happening, that one of the consequences of that is they started to then investigate who knew what before the flash crash took place. Who was available doing business, certain types of business, unusual business perhaps, before the crash took place. The same was seen on 9-11. When we saw 9-11, we obviously then saw that the Treasury, the central banks, a lot of intelligence agencies, the staffers at the FBI, CIA, an awful lot of analysis started to go into the arrival rate, the surprising, the unusual, the informed arrival rates that went into certain markets at certain times before 9-11 took place. In other words, somebody somewhere was monetizing the knowledge of what was going to happen in the future. Now, in some countries, this is a legitimate process. If we go out to the Arab nations, if we go out to Russia, the concept of manipulating price is actually just a normal business practice. The idea of using informed, you know, having that inside information and using it to make money is normal process. It used to be normal process in the Europe and UK and in the US as well. It used to be normal. Spoofing was not necessarily brilliantly uh, supported, but it certainly wasn't illegal to spoof a marketplace to apply liquidity and pull it until ultimately they made the process illegal. Well, that's pretty much the same kind of concept. The idea of putting a buy order into a market that has no intention of buying or a sell order into a market that is likely to go 
higher instead of lower to try and encourage sellers to connect. So this idea of informed source is at the core of everything we do as traders. But what do we make of it in the retail space? What can we make of it? Is there any way we can understand the concept of informed trading in the retail space? Well, one of the keys to this whole concept is, of course, something called VPIN. And VPIN comes from a, an original study made uh, you know, quite some time ago, many decades ago, in fact, uh, when I was a, a youngster as well. And uh, uh, PIN was basically about the probability of uh, money arriving, which was coming from an informed source. So this comes back to this question here. The first thing I've got to ask is, do you agree that this is what would happen? If you knew, for example, if you were the market maker, if you were this fella in the background here, if you knew that the phone call was coming in from this chappy here, you'd be happy to do their business. I assume you would be. Now, if you disagree with me, that's fair enough, but there's not very much I can show you then if you disagree. But if you also agree that if Goldman Sachs is coming on and you believe that they are bullish because of their order, the idea is that this is now an informed source and what happened to the price? Well, we can already recognize exactly what happened to the price. If we were to draw a candle based on the last trade, and we'll assume the last trade was the mid price here, well, of course, that means that the candle looks a little bit like this. So we can see that this idea of this money arriving, this order arriving, has the effect of a price going higher. The market maker pulls away their offer, and therefore we can recognize that that takes place. Now imagine that this guy comes back in for another 10. Well, you're going to look at that and say, well, I'm going to offer 55 this time. So if the guy comes in and wants to buy another 10, you say, well, I'm going to pay 55. And that's the price that uh, comes out the marketplace. You quote them 50-55 or 53-55. You start bringing up your bids because you're now worried about this price taking off. And that creates price movement. This guy comes in for another 10 and you see the same price. The candle basically sits there doing this. You see a little candle that goes bid off or spread, 46 sellers, 47 buyers, and the price spins. You get this little crap candle. Volume might come into it. It might not come into it. It's unlikely that there's going to be big volume, but you get this crappy little spinner candle that really doesn't contain any new information for us. If you agree that that is real, if you agree that that is normal, well, this is becomes probably the single most important question that we can ask as traders. What is the probability that the order we've just seen is an informed buyer or an informed seller? What's the probability that that is the case? What am I expecting from that bit of business? Now, we've obviously got certain tools that we can apply to that question. What I want you to think about yourself is, what tools do you apply to that question right now for yourself? Now, this is all coming back to this point that we're assuming you agree with this point, and I would never ask anybody to agree. I would ask people to, just because you know I'm telling you, it's not that point. It's about agreeing with the central bank in New York that this is one of the most, if not the most important point in the marketplace. This is the single most important question that anybody trying to figure out what the market is doing can ask. What's the probability that this order is informed? What's the probability that I'm going to get absolutely mauled by this trade? Is it a high probability? And if it's a high probability, I want to try and avoid it. I want to try and pass off this trade to somebody else. I don't want to be involved in this deal. If I get that question wrong, if I understand that question and I get the question wrong, I could be in serious trouble. When we look at some other research papers, and there's literally thousands of them, let's take a look at this little research paper here. Market makers face an interesting set of challenges, which is why one of these, uh, one of the things we're building as part of the Krypton Challenge is a market making algorithm. Okay, so forget about that part. Liquidity provision is a thorny problem, partly because market makers are always facing the probability of trading against an informed party, someone who has a short-term informational advantage. 
trades arriving from informed traders are referred to as toxic orders. And being on the losing side of this kind of trade is known as adverse selection in world of finance or economics. So when we think about this idea that trades arriving from informed traders are toxic and therefore being on the wrong side of this toxicity is the biggest single challenge for market makers. Well, it surely therefore represents possibly the biggest opportunity for us as traders. Why? Well, if we can understand that there is a toxic order coming in or why a toxic order may come in, then of course we have this edge because we know what the market maker response is going to be. We've already suggested that the market maker response to this would be to pull liquidity. Well, imagine just for a second, if you knew that this order was going to hit the screens, you could be buying up all the business here at 46, 47 during this phase here. You could be in your phone booth, making this phone call, getting this 46 and 47 trade filled. And inside that booth, you're starting to think about how much money you're going to make from this bit of business. Because you know this phone call is matters of literally seconds or minutes away. Is it possible that we can even understand that this is the case? That there's going to be an informed person on the phone? Well, the answer to that question is yes, it is very possible. How? Well, that's what we're going to be exploring in the classroom sessions that we're going to do next week. We're going to be exploring this arrival of orders, then idea that a lot of these arrivals are predictable. The basic matrix of the markets allows us to understand that the arrival is predictable. I'll give you two examples. We know that the biggest volumes of the day will happen at the cash close and the cash open. So there's two massive arrivals of orders, a huge amount of which will be informed and a huge number of which will be fear and greed from traders who are in the wrong side from the previous day at the open and traders who are closing out losing or winning positions at the closing bell on the day traders. So there's a lot of uh, false money coming into the markets at those stages as well. But how do we separate the false from the real? How do we separate the uninformed from the informed? Do your stochastics help you? Do your MACDs help you? Do your RSIs help you? Well, the answer is no, they don't. How can they possibly help you? How do they know the difference between a down candle with 50 contracts and a down candle with 50 contracts? It looks to a stochastic or a MACD or an RSI to be exactly the same. But one of them could be from Goldman Sachs and one of them could be from a series of Joe Punters. So which one is which? How do we know how to deal? How do we know how to find what that order is telling us? Well, as I said, we've got plenty of tools that can allow you to start making progression against this. We can actually also call on a very, very famous person from the history pages, a chappy called Sir Isaac Newton. And we can obviously call on Isaac because Isaac came out with three laws. And whilst we're not in tending to get into this in terms of a, a big work on the three laws of Isaac, we can obviously work on the idea of, well, what do they mean to me as a trader? We'll show you some live examples on the S&P today as it's been happening to give you an idea that just by recognizing the concept of something acting that is not expected to act is part of this idea of Newton economics, Newton economics. Now, this works from another series of studies, which you may, have, may not have came across, which is called the Nash Equilibrium. The Nash Equilibrium came from, comes from a game theory. And game theory suggests that price things will only change if there's a reason to change, very much like the idea of momentum inside of a Newton process. If there's no force acting against it, it'll stay where it's at. And Nash equilibrium suggests that that's the case. If there is no incentive for somebody to change what they're doing, they won't change what they're doing. This also has this idea of linking in beautifully with the concept that we have from the market makers, from the idea of this arrival rate, from the idea of the VPIN, the probability 
of an informed trader arriving. Let's take a look at one of our tools. This is the ZN contract, and the pink line is what we call the informed trader line. We learn a little bit about the informed trader line as we go, and that if we trade, we always prefer to trade in line with the informed trader. Now, sometimes the informed trader has no information for us. But if the informed trader line is bullish, we are more likely to look to buy into this. And you can see that this market went bullish way before the price took off the bottom edges here. You can see that before this top edge was finished, you can see the market went very bearish. We were able to then look at this and say, well, the inside money, the smart money suggests that this looks like a top line sell. You can see as we trade into this enormous arrival of volumes, that according to the smart money, this arrival of volume is a very bullish arrival. So we can obviously look at that arrival of volume and we can understand that there is an opportunity to go long here if it ties in with our own other understanding of other elements. This is the 10-year treasury notes. And obviously you can see that the arrival of massive volume there allowed you to pick up a very substantial upside pop on the 10-year coming into today's US cash open. So this is very important. We know that at the US cash open, for example, we know there's going to be an arrival rate, a sizable, imbalanced arrival rate. One of the very conditions that we spotted in that little conversation from the Federal Reserve, when they talked about the asymmetrical arrival rate being their biggest source of concern. In fact, for any market maker anywhere in the world, an asymmetrical arrival rate is the biggest source for concern because it's going to be their biggest possibility of losing money. It has some really serious negative consequences for a market maker to get that informed trader wrong. So when we see this informed trading, it's not about us selling this blindly. It's about recognizing that we believe something is happening in here that we can take advantage of and then drive a sale into this market. The other things we can recognize is that the blue, the yellow, and the pink dots on the charts are arrival rates. They don't all mean something. Not every time we see an arrival rate, it's gonna be a trade. We simply use these elements to start highlighting the fact that we've got an arrival rate and we have in forum trading and we have, and we build a process. We build a process around this called the benchmarking process. The benchmarking process allows us to, even when we get one piece of the jigsaw changing on us, and these things can change very, very quickly, we don't lose the trade. I'm not interested in what a trade makes. I just don't want to lose any money on any trades. It might make one tick profit. It might make 100 ticks profit. That's not what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me is not losing money every day. Different mindset. Market makers have the same opinion. They don't want to lose money. They're not sure what they're going to make because that's all down to how many times they can churn the money around. How many times can they get a bid offer spread working in a balance? So when we see this, now, why is this important? Because we all understand the market maker model. Well, at least I think we understand the market maker model. And when we get into Monday's webinar, which will also be free for you guys to join us, We'll work more on the actual webinar itself. We will work on the market maker model. We will do the market maker model with you for the last hour of trading that particular day so that you can obviously try it for yourself and then get to feel the concept of that market maker process. So we will be doing that exercise on Monday. So please come along and join us. And obviously we'll be doing a lot more of that process when we get into the actual uh, classroom sessions proper following the webinar's close. On Monday, we'll be starting on Tuesday. But in the meantime, what we've got to try and understand is why these areas, why this top line, why this bottom line is so important for the market maker process. Well, let's just take a little sidestep whilst we're at it. Let's think about this market maker for a second, and I'll get a little blank piece of paper. And uh, we'll start looking at what the market maker model is. Well, we know that the market maker is a passive trader. Now, they're not always passive. Sometimes they cross the spread. Sometimes they do a lot of business. Sometimes they accumulate inventory, sometimes. Uh, a lot of the times they actively accumulate inventory, and other times they passively 
non-actively end up accumulating because they don't have any choice. It happens. So when you're a market maker, you're obviously setting out this concept called fair value. So therefore, understanding what fair value is, is incredibly important to any market maker. Fair value is just the price that the market maker basically wants to achieve. They want to get buyers and sellers. You know, they want to find some buyers above fair value because they can sell back to fair value. They want to find some sellers below fair value so they can buy back to fair value. They'll rotate price to fair value because somebody's overpaid or somebody's sold at too cheap a price. So in other words, what does that look like? Well, it looks basically like this. As the price moves away from fair value, the market maker will be a buyer. So obviously, we can understand that the move away from this price is starting to cause the market maker to accumulate a net long position. On the contrary, on the other side of fair value, a move away from this, the market maker is going to start accumulating a short position. And this brings out some terms that have been used and adopted in the retail space that is perfectly valid, no reason why not to. The terms are aggregation. And the reason what aggregate, well, the point about aggregation is at some stage, the market maker reaches a price that they know they want to defend or they need to defend because they've got too long an inventory position. So obviously the idea is that sometimes you will see that obviously what's happening here is the volume is very flat and then we'll reach a point where we get a big spike in volume and a big buy trade or a big sell trade comes in at that point. Obviously, this is what we would call aggregation. They're starting to aggregate the market for some reason. And obviously, the idea there is the price is then generated back towards fair value. And you can see it doesn't take a market that's been very short from this point. It doesn't take very far for the market maker actually to be in profit. In fact, it only takes them to go back here for the market maker to end up actually in net profit position. In other words, we find things like the halfback trade always becomes an interesting point of reference. In fact, in the olden days, if anybody's been around as long as I have, and I've been around since the very, very early 80s, everybody will remember things like the treasury bonds and the idea that in the olden days, the treasury bonds used to work on eight tick pullbacks and 16 tick extensions. So we see that this is still actually valid today when you look at the likes of the treasury bond or the ultra bond. You can see that generally as a rule, we always work on eight tick pullbacks and 16 tick extension trades. So every market has that same setup. On oil, 50 tick extensions, 25, 20 tick pullbacks. On gold, 50 tick extensions, 25, 30 tick pullbacks. On the S&P, uh, 20, 20 tick kind of extensions, eight to 10 tick pullbacks. So these are all things that have been around the work markets forever, but it doesn't mean that we simply just go into the markets and start dealing. So in other words, when the price pulls back into this area here, the market maker has an opportunity to balance their books, but they might not want to. Why might they not want to balance the books here? By balance the books, I mean, they're obviously very long and the market maker could try and sell out their positions from this point here. But why might they not want to do it? because they might recognize that in this area, there was a lot of toxic buyers. There was a lot of informed buyers in this area. Therefore, the market maker might want to hold on to this long inventory position as long as possible, because they believe that the informed buyers may still come in at higher prices. The market maker doesn't want to be on the other side of those guys. So obviously what happens is the market maker pulls away the liquidity and we get this fast money break away from this price point. We can see that that happens and it happens and it's also visible when it happens on simple Newtonian. If we look at Newtonian concepts, we look at the idea of fast and slow, we can recognize this very, very simple process in operation. A lot of people talk about trend lines and trend lines get a bad rap and for a rightful reason, they're rubbish. But that's because people use the wrong trend line. If I was to draw a chart for you here and I said to you, draw me a trend line. OK, we'll draw a line instead of a bar. If I said to you, draw me a trend line in this chart, I can always invariably know that 99% of you will draw me that trend line there and say, well, there's your trend line. Well, that's wrong. It's never been the case. That trend line means almost nothing. And the reason why that trend line means almost nothing is because, well, well what, what does it mean? What does it show me? It doesn't show me much. It's also not a price that has anybody in trouble. 
The market maker loves this idea. The market maker loves this phase. The market maker loves this phase because the market maker is rebalancing books during those pullback phases. So whether they pull back halfway or whether they pull back 75% of the way or 100% of the prior swing, the market maker loves this phase. What we need to do is, as traders trying to understand the concept of arrival rates of informed trading is to understand when the market maker is starting to feel uncomfortable. So when does the market maker feel uncomfortable? The market maker feels uncomfortable if you draw your trend line from the bottom edges. The market maker feels uncomfortable when we go below this price here. The market maker may well have caused that to go below. The concept of closing off sellers at lower prices to bring in buyers at key wholesale should not be lost on anybody. But this becomes an incredibly important price point. So one of the main takeaways for today's little classroom if there's going to be anything that you want to take away from it is to be able to recognize that this is a thing this price is a thing let's take a look at the s p in the last short while this is a 10 second chart so that we see lots of examples if i look at the first failed auction and i draw the reverse trend line off the first failed auction which puts me into this pivot price here and i draw that trend line there look at how many times this touches this price level here do you see it Obviously, this is where we start the trend line from and to. So there's the starting point there to there. So we're not obviously doing something that nobody understands. That's your starting point there to there. So all the rest of this is now predictable. This is what we call V equals one. This is what we call V equals one for a very obvious reason, because this is velocity. This is Newtonian physics. This is just simply the velocity of a market move. The velocity is how fast price moves through time. How fast an object moves through time is that velocity. And the velocity is constant at one if the price stays on this line. If the price ever runs away from this line, and you can see at this stage here it runs away from this line, there must have been a force acting on price here. And therefore, this becomes a very, very important price level. This becomes what we know as the art trade level here. So you draw a straight line from that intersection and call it the art trade. This is a very important price, and it's just picked out of nowhere, really, by the looks of it. And all, every single one of you can do this on any time frame chart, any time frame chart at all. And you can see that this art trade provides us with something changing in the market maker's world. The market maker is happily applying bids here that caused the bounce that created this opportunity for us to now establish what V equals one looks like. So when the price touches back into this V equals one here, we can now recognize that the market maker should normally, should normally apply bids into this price. It's a declining marketplace. So where do you trade back into this? Well, you can obviously trade this line, but obviously that would suggest that you know what's going to happen at this line. And a lot of occasions you don't. Is the market maker going to do what they did here and pull? Or is the market maker going to do what they did here and bid it back up? Well, we've got to have tools that allow us to make that decision. One of the lines that we do pay attention to, of course, and we talked about the trend line, is we don't have a diagonal on the top line, but what we do have on the top line is we have the V equals zero. In other words, where velocity is now zero, we now know that anytime we reach a new one point, we now know that the prior high is now V equals zero. And this gives us a very easy mathematical way of looking for a sellable opportunity. So there's V equals zero right there. Now, I'm not saying you're going to sell that, but it's certainly the starting point for an inquiry. It's the starting point for you to say, I quite like the idea that we can get a V equals zero trade into that kind of area. We can look for opportunities to figure out whether that is a trade or whether it's not a trade. We can look at relative value. We can look at the smart money, for example, to ask the exact question, is there a reason? Can I see that reason? Is there a smart money seller coming into price at that point? So when we come into this price level, that's exactly what we should be doing. 
we should now be interrogating the charts, the order flow, the value, the relative value. And obviously, these are all things that we'll be touching on in the classroom when we get started. We'll be looking at the concept of refreshed order books. We'll be ch challenging the charts to tell us whether there was a, a sell trade opportunity here. Well, if I look at that particular trade at that particular point, if you remember what we showed you before about the pink line dropping or the pink line rising, then you can obviously understand that this is exactly that point on the chart here. And you can see that at that point right there at 1956 and 40 seconds, you can see the pink line dropped on that red candle right there. So obviously what's happening there is that the informed trader is now going short into this red candle. And that gives us an idea that this is now a real money, real informed sell opportunity off the V0 level. And obviously the takeaway from that trade wasn't exactly the most earth shattering, but it still made some nice tasty monies and we love the monies. When we look at these other ideas, there's other things we can try and interrogate from our chart point of view. We have other elements. So we can look at some of these other ideas and we can see into this area here, there was a bit of value divergence. Now, obviously that's on the very, very micro chart basis. And you can see that that value divergence started to change here when we started to see this developing here, but there's more than one idea of value. We also have the concept of volatility pricing and whether the volatility is bullish or bearish and the volatility was still very very bearish for stocks during that period so there's an offset so in other words we don't have a very strong case other than to sell into this and take the market short now if we sell into that at 65 by the time we get this art break to the downside we're trading down at 53. 65 to 53 if i'm not mistaken is a pretty good profit if you can make $600 in 10 minutes per contract by simply recognizing that V equals zero trade based on a failed auction, based on this auction theory process, I'm sure you'll be very happy to find that one trade a day. Well, the good news is you'll probably find 10 or 20 of these trades every day, not just one. The second opportunity you may have been able to look at, of course, is this art trade here. You'll be able to pick up on that type of bit of business there as well. So what else could we do? Well, we can obviously continue to develop the new V plus one and we can start looking at the new V plus one and we can draw the line and we can see we never reached that line. So when we then find the next trade level here and the next failed auction and the next level here, we can see that this trade comes in here. We can see that there is a very small V equals one line. We can see it accelerates away from this, which suggests that this again is a possible art trade area here. And we draw a line against that art trade. And again, it's just very good technicals, isn't it? It's just a technical study that we can start to recognize that there is a possible art trade right here. Simply by recognizing that something took place here that resulted in a sell off, suggesting that this price is very important. And because it's angled with failed auctions and it holds the offer, it becomes even more important. So we recognize that trade. Now, obviously, if we get a break here and it immediately goes bid, then this bottom line becomes a zero point. This becomes V equals zero. Now, obviously, on the basis of what happens here, we can recognize that this art trade is also pretty much in the same area here as this top line of that bracket before it broke. So that's obviously going to be your V equals zero line in the background. So you're already getting that concept of confluence. Now, as you can see that that trade continues quite nicely, actually, to the downside. As we continue this process, we can recognize that as we just join the dots, we can recognize this type of thing happening here. Do you see how many times this touches? Now, you may say, well, what about touching this one? Well, that's, that's not a V equals one, that's a V equals zero. It's a different kind of line. It has no velocity on it. We want to find lines that have velocity. We want to find lines that are sloping down. If they're just going straight across the chart, then it's just V equals zero, which is why this one's a little bit cheeky because it is only marginally dropping. So when we find that velocity, you might say, can we not join the dots from here to here? Yeah, of course we can. There isn't a hard and fast rule in this. It's just by recognizing that something happened 
that's different from what happened before. Something took place into this area. And we can recognize that when we accelerated past this area, albeit for a tiny little fraction, it's still important information that there may be something taking place here because it didn't continue. And then when we see the price pull back to what would have been the V0 level here, and the price holds above the V0 level, we now know that there is a very high probability that we're going to be trading at least back to this level here, because that's what the market maker would do. They'd pull their liquidity. And you can see we did trade all the way back to that level there. So the second concept that we have to understand is this concept of toxicity. Toxicity comes from this idea of VPIN. The VPIN comes from this identification that there is an informed trader doing something quite informed in that trade area. By recognizing an informed trader, we can recognize opportunities. When I see a, an arrival of big volume, we always ask the question, what is that arrival of big volume? What am I wanting to gauge from that big arrival? Is it bullish or is it bearish? We can ask that question on many occasions. We can interrogate our charts. And in fact, we're going to do that right now to tidy off this concept. Let's take a look at gold. This is gold on a one minute chart. As I said, it can be on a daily chart. It can be on a five minute chart. It can be on whatever time frame you wish. It's the same principle. We have a value line, and it doesn't matter what the value line is here, because this is just our way of trying to gauge whether the arrival is expected to be correct or not. When we talk about the arrival rate, we can talk about big volumes. These are the big arrival rate questions. Now, for some of these volumes, they're not that important because they're inside the market, and therefore inside the market is good for the market maker. And we've got to be able to recognize that they're not that dangerous. The biggest danger to the market maker is when we start moving to the outside of the marketplace. So when I draw the pin from that point there to the pin at that point there, we know that that arrival here is one of the biggest dangers to the market. And obviously the value is still bullish at that stage, no trade, fair value. As we start to see this very, very aggressive short sale coming in here, we start recognizing that there is net value on the buy side we can start recognizing that we come through several V0 levels. For example, here, there's a V0 level here. So when we see that big increase in volume at a V0 level here, can we expect that this is the arrival of knowledgeable orders? We can, can't we? If there was a smart money seller in here for whatever reason, then, of course, with the value divergent here coming into this V0 level, we know that there's a high probability that that volume, that volume represents smart money buyers. It might be a smart money buyer that's just closing off their short positions because it looks as if based on the background here that, you know, we could deem this to be fair value. It look, looks a little bit thin in terms of value in terms of this level. But if we continue to go in the background and we start to look at these other V0 levels here, we can see that there's balance areas here that we also have V0s. So when we recognize that the V equals zero in these price levels, we're also able to recognize that there is a genuine reason, especially when the short term value turns back bullish. There's a genuine reason why when we reach these V0 levels, that this is an arrival rate we want to know about and we want to buy into. Well, if that's the case and we start recognizing some of these arrivals and we recognize that through these arrivals, we recognize big value and big volume starting to come in. And we recognize, for example, this enormous buy side pop and value here and an enormous buy side pop and volume here. This is also a toxic candle. Well, if this is a toxic candle, we want to mark it as such. We want to mark this area because this is an incredibly important price area to highlight going forward. If this toxicity remains on our charts, we can obviously deal in this area in the future. So we recognize it in hindsight, but it provides us with an edge going forward. If the price were to trade back in here, and if we had the tools to be able to determine whether this was still toxic out of this price level. As we trade into this area, we can obviously start watching to see whether that toxicity comes back into the marketplace. And when we see the price retesting, 
you can see that the value is actually divergent against where we were before. When the value is divergent, then of course the toxicity is very likely to return. What else can you spot from that narrative? What else we can spot from that narrative is V equals greater than one. If I draw a line across the charts, and bearing in mind, guys, that this is 1956, this is this evening, you know, as we get into this classroom. So this trade, ex you know, set up perfectly for us here. So we've got V equals one. We've got that extension suggesting that we've got something acting here to close off the sellers, to allow the liquidity back into this toxic buyer level. And we can recognize in the background against where we had traded before here, before this toxic takeaway, we can recognize that there is a very sizable value advantage to buy into gold at this price. The level is perfectly visible for everybody to spot. The narrative is crystal clear. The storyline is crystal clear. A break of the V1 level gives us an edge because it's not normal, it's abnormal. In other words, we have the conditions for a market maker to look at that's going to suggest that this is a dangerous trade if they get this wrong. Well, they're not going to get that wrong. This is an absolute given with the value that's available that this is called a discount. Is this not the most important question we can ask as well as a trader? Do stochastics tell us when we've got cheaper, expensive prices? In other words, if I told you the stochastic was oversold on oil at 40, does that suggest oil can't go up to $120 a barrel? Of course it doesn't. So stochastics can't show me whether something's cheap or expensive. Stochastic can just tell me whether the price is higher than it was 20 candles ago. So in other words, it has nothing to tell me. It hasn't got any pieces of information that can illuminate this decision that I'm trying to make at this point. The stochastic will, of course, be at the bottom edge. So will most indicators be at the bottom edge, but so will most indicators be at the bottom edge on this candle. And then in this balance area here, they'll be at bottom edges, just the same way as all the way through this rally here, they'll be at top edges. So what's the point? It doesn't inform me. It doesn't tell me whether there's informed buyers coming in. It doesn't tell me whether there's a top edge seller dominating this line price here at 50. In fact, we've got the tools that can also help us with this. If we know that these V0 areas are very important, we also know that measured moves are very important. Why? Because if you've ever been on the floor, you'll recognize that floor mathematics is really quite basic. There was an awful lot of very, not very clever people on the floor of the exchange. These guys didn't need to have any special qualifications. They just needed to have a float to get on the floor and hopefully turn into the next big prospector. That's the kind of game we were in, of course, the idea of just prospecting, hoping to get it right, hoping to hit lucky as early as possible and make your monies. So the math wasn't that advanced. And obviously, when you're on the floor, you don't have computers, you don't have calculators even. You've just simply got your ability to add one and one. So when we know that the next V0 is at this price here, and then we know that that is obviously going to be a, an arrival rate when we head into this liquidity pool, then of course, where the, where's the next liquidity pool? Where is the next V0 when there's nothing to the left-hand side? Well, it's dead obvious. If that price there is at 46 and this price here is at 39, then of course, we already know that 46 and 39 gives us an idea that it's going to be about seven points higher. So what we do is we take some of that money off and say, well, seven points higher off of 46 puts us just over the 50. We can use the Fibonacci tool to spot that, of course, not using Fibonacci, but we can use the Fibonacci tool to spot it if you change the settings. And you can see that this top box here is the box that we are most interested in. Mathematically, there's an awful lot of algorithms that use this box as a profit take. It's just a measured move. That's all it is. So the fact that it ties in with the wholesale price at 50, even though there's no value to sell it, the price still comes down because everybody in the world is taking profits at that point. Everybody, as soon as the price nudges over 50, everybody starts selling. And obviously if the price doesn't develop above 50, then everybody sells in this candle. And that causes the pullback to take place. 
So we can start to recognize the storyline. Now, what happened to this buy trade here at 43? Well, of course, we've now got a new V0 at the top line here. We can see that 50 is now the target price for this trade. And you can see what happened. We got all the way back to the 50 line almost perfectly, almost without thinking. We set up another couple of toxic candles. You can see this candle here has a very, very high volume, very high arrival rate. And we can recognize that the price did continue. So obviously going forward, you would want to recognize that candle's importance. This is not the toxic candle. The toxic buying behavior did not take place necessarily in this candle itself. The toxic buying took place in the balance area before this candle took place here. So that's the area you mark off your charts. Some people kind of understand that as bullish or bearish order blocks, but you know they never ever go in to explain why it's important or what ones are valid and what ones aren't. But that is a real money toxic buyer behavior level. And therefore we can recognize with the target price of this line here, we've just achieved it and the value is divergent. So that is what we would call a full exit price. And this happened just uh, three or four minutes ago. So there it is right there. If you'd bought this 39 and you'd added in at 43s and it's now traded 50, you can obviously recognize that the buy side swing here was worth over $1,000 and then the buy side swing here was worth $700. So since seven o'clock till eight o'clock, nine o'clock just now, from this point here in the last two hours, you've probably been able to do around about $1,700 per contract as the crow flies into these targets. Now, obviously that's assuming you're holding them for perfect pricings. Nobody can do that, of course, but we're just obviously giving you the best case possible. It would have been almost impossible not to have made money, bearing in mind that we already knew about this V0 level here, and if we, even if we'd taken this one and managed to scratch out for that one for a zero, we could still have came back in at this lower price level and made the big splash on that trade there. Bearing in mind, we had all this background value for this buy trade to kick off into. So when we understand this as a process, when we understand this idea, this comes across our charts all the time. There are very few examples that simply don't help us. Let's take a look at what happened on the S&P in the last short while here. Failed auction in the background, low pivot price there. If I take that v, Z, v equals one right there, and I draw that level there, we can all recognize I've just touched the last pivot there. And obviously it's not a, an exact science, it's an area. So we start looking in this area here and we can see that there is this art trade continuation. That means this is gonna be a very important price. Well, it happened just eight minutes ago that the price pulled back to exactly that point. Now, is this a good example? Of course it is, because there is definitely a V equals one in this area, isn't there? We can simply recognize that V equals one at that point, and when it accelerates past V equals one, something happened in this price that acted. So law one, Newton's law one, suggests that somebody applied force to this, which created velocity. In other words, the price is now in motion. Once the price is in motion, the price should stay in motion until something happens. We get this idea that we get force happening here. Why is force happening here? Because we see an acceleration. Do we understand that Newton's law number two suggests that force equals mass times acceleration? So in other words, when we see that velocity increases, acceleration must have shown up in this area. So we can recognize that law number two results in this push through this V equals one level. This becomes a very, very important inflection point on the screens. It doesn't mean it's going to be a sell, but it means that we're gonna be looking for a possible sell from this price point. And again, a nice opportunity to deal off of that price at that stage. And obviously from that price at 47s, it traded 41s and that trade was worth six points, another $300 profit for anybody that wanted to do business there. It is a 10 second chart after all. So it's not as if, you know, we're having to wait around too long for that to make us our money. 2052 to 2054 took us just two minutes. So when we see some of these ideas, simply drawing in the V zeros, 
in a buy market or a sell market can inform our trade throws. So we see a market that is selling off on a failed auction. We can draw the V0 against the last pivot. The market sells off and we have a pivot there. We can draw V0 against the last pivot. Well, would those two sales not have been useful to you? Would that sell there not have been useful to take a look at? Would this sell here not have been simply useful to take a look at? Simple stuff. Simple stuff done often. Simple stuff done repeatedly. Verified by what we see on order flow. Verified by what we see on some of the other tools. What else could we add to this? Well, let's think about what else we might want to add to this. When we think about the direction of the market, the bias of the market, it's very useful to have a ready reckoner. What did the floor traders have as a very ready reckoner in terms of bias of the marketplace? Anybody know? Well, the answer is, of course, they had the big board. Would they we mean the big board? Well, have you ever seen the big board on the New York Stock Exchange or the floors of the other exchanges back in the day? The big board contained the prices of all the other asset classes, perhaps different contracts as well. The big board gave the traders on the floor an idea of what was happening globally and locally. The big board gave them a sentiment. If the big board is shining red and every no number that comes through is another red number and every change is a red change, we know that the market is probably going to be following this projection here. We can obviously try and understand the coloring of the big board. Well, alternatively, you could simply look to see what the big board color was. When we apply the coloring to the big board, we can see that the big board is red here. It's red. It's neutral here, it's red here. So when it's red, what we do is we find those green pivots. And these are just pivots. You can see the last green pivot was there. So there's one, there's a red market and there's a green pivot. So there's another one. So when we draw those pivots into the markets, we can recognize that these are real money bias, sell side bias, tradable opportunities. Now, we don't see this one because this is a different type of trade based on this acceleration or deceleration from these points here. But it's still, nonetheless, a red market. We're still sailing in the direction of the bias of the marketplace. Is this bias any use to us? Well, it depends how we use it, just like every other tool. We can see that this market, we can change when we go red and when we go green. We can see that we went blue during this phase here. But this is from the market and close orders. We don't have to use the market and close orders. If I look at the market and close orders and I change it and they take off the market and close orders here, I can now look at it from the point of view without the market and close. I can now look at it from the cash open and simply trade in the direction of the cash open predominantly. From the cash open, the market is predominantly red. It flashes blue here and it goes red here. And we try, we try and stay on the red side. You'll notice that there are a few large arrival rates coming into the screens as well. So you'll see these arrival rates. Now, obviously, when we get an arrival rate, we want to find a V0. Well, this arrival rate has a V0 in the background. It's a long time ago, of course. It's not as relevant as one that's you know, current. So this arrival rate here is far more important to me. So you can see that we get an idea that this is almost a given that we should be selling this in a red biased marketplace. When we see this arrival coming in here, we can recognize in the background that there are a couple of key pivot prices that we may wanna pay attention to for that arrival rate to take place. When this arrival rate showed up there, you can see there was one in the background that might allow us to take a short. Now, some of these trades developed, and this trade scratched out, this trade developed quite nicely. In fact, the retest was just as good. When we see these markets, you can see that when we go back to the overnight session or the London session, again, you can see this London session arrival rate. You can see big sales coming in here and big sell again here, a big sell again here, another big sell in here, a sell in here. These aren't sales that you're expected to take. These are just indicators. We're far better than an indicator. We're all able to figure out for ourselves whether we want to join this arrival or not. We simply don't have to take what it says. We simply have the ability to interact with these arrival rates and figure out whether it's informed. This doesn't tell us that this is an informed seller or this. This is just a volume node. 
you can have this volume node on your own screens anytime you like. There's thousands of indicators available for you to put that volume node on your screens. VSA indicators that highlight high volume up candles or high volume down candles is one such indicator, any type of these things. But the idea is that we have a context. The idea that through this context, we can recognize, you know, obviously things like cash open sweeps. We can recognize some of these ideas here. We can recognize, for example, we can recognize from the cash open, we can recognize that that is also an art trade level. From the cash open here, there's the cash open low price there. We could recognize that this is a little bit tight. We're never going to reach that price, are we? We're never going to reach that price. But we can start recognizing that when we then see a buyer coming in here, we can start readjusting to the lowest price and we can start adjusting to that point. And all of a sudden, you can see this interaction at this point here. These things do require to be redone. But it's in the redoing that the breakthroughs are made, this idea that by recognizing that something took place that is not normal, the idea that this toxic behavior is showing up, this buyer at higher prices, this idea here, liquidity provision is a thorny problem because market makers are always facing the probability of trading against an informed party. Trades arriving from informed traders are referred to as toxic orders. Being on the losing side is known as adverse selection. So when we understand that this is critical, if we can tell what that arrival, if we can tell what that arrival is going to be, if we can tell what that informed trader is doing, if we can have our own VPIN concept, then we can get in front of the market maker. Imagine that. We can actually get in front of the market maker who is going to do certain things at certain prices to figure out what they fancy in this trade. When we know that any one of these V zeros or V equals one trade areas, so we can see a failed auction there, we can see a little pivot there, we can draw a line. And if I draw that line, can you see what happens? We end up joining the dots here and then the dot here, and then we have this art trade here. Well, what is that arrival rate? What is that arrival rate there? What happened here? What caused this? And is it bearish or is it bullish? If I look at the price of volatility, if I look at the price of value, if I look at the net pricing, I can see that there's no way I can tell what that is. There's nothing that shows me what that is other than the fact that when the candle took place originally, you can see that when that candle took place, the value was actually bullish divergent. So your first gut feel was that that arrival was to close off sellers to get net long. And at the end of that candle, you would have taken a buy opportunity. You would have then have been able to analyze it from different angles. You could have analyzed it from the price of volatility. You could have analyzed it from the price of gamma. You could analyze it from the price of rotations. You could come into the market from different angles and ask the same question. Is it bullish or is it bearish? You could wait for it to break out and then buy into it. There's a lot of different ways we can deal. It's not about fading bottom edges and fading top edges. When we get this arrival rate coming in here, we can obviously recognize that this is also something that needs to be challenged. This is something that needs to be analyzed. And again, we can ask the question, well, this one might be debatable. You might be sitting there saying, I'm not sure whether I think that's bullish or bearish, and I would be 100% in agreement with you. I couldn't tell you whether it's bullish or bearish either. I think the retest is a little bit better here because we've started to see this balance. But I can tell you with 100% certainty that that trade is absolutely mispriced. And you can see that if we join the dots from there to there, that this acceleration started in exactly the same place, this tie in, this confluence of accelerations taking place in that area against quite a strong reversal in terms of the components. As we see the components going in bearish, there's no question in my mind, none whatsoever, that this is going to be a sell trade opportunity at 1506. And obviously it's up to us to then say, well, am I going to find that as an opportunity? How am I going to trade this? 
you can trade it on the way up, you can trade it on the way back down again. There's a lot of different ways to dice this, and there is no right and wrong way. There's just whatever way you decide to trade it is the right way. So was there toxic buyer behavior? Was this idea that this was an informed trade? Well, let's take a look at what the informed traders were showing us on the S&P at that exact point. If you remember, we already highlighted this informed trader line, and you can see that the informed trader line is suggesting that at top edges, this is very bearish. The informed traders seem to be incredibly bearish on a macro chart basis. They seem to be selling to every buyer that shows up and therefore where the big trade is going to be is going to be above this previous level here. So we know that that is going to be the big opportunity to maybe get a bit of short selling into this trade. The value suggests that this is a big sell. The smart money suggests that this is a big sell. So if everybody suggests it's a big sell, guess what, guys? Probably going to be a big sell. So we can recognize that the smart money agrees with this V0 level, this art level, this opportunity to deal. The smart money is telling us that this arrival, this arrival, and when we look at volume, we can see that the volume's not that good, but it's still relatively good compared to this drop off in volume in the rally phase. But even the big drop off in volume for most people would be a red flag. The value collapsing into that top edge suggests that there's a lack of buyers and therefore what they're trying to do here is they're trying to get liquidity into the top lines as we get into the top line of course the sale at 69 obviously becomes a very 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 impressive short you can see that that trade in its own from the cash open results in a short sale at 69 trading down to a low price eventually by the time we got the first little pullback here once we hit into this v0 level here you're trading 52s 69 to 52 is 17 points or $850 profit per contract by the time we reach that V0 level or V equals one level. The V0 level was here around about 56, but obviously we can make a new analysis on this V0 level here. But because this market is on the red side, I would rather trade the V1. So this is great news. We have the tools, we have the ability, we have the concept, we have this idea that this is the most important question that we can ask. What is the probability of informed traders coming in at this high price? What is the probability that that trade there is different from what it was before? The probability tells me that there is an informed decision being made. I don't know what it is. That's what the other tools are there to tell me. If the price carries on going, then of course the informed decision is toxic buying, and it's just simply that, that visible. But it doesn't keep going, does it? It comes back inside this level. It suggests that that toxic trader is actually a seller, and then the kind of break lower here that we see is very clearly selling back into this, and obviously a big drop then develops. Every chart we look at has the same quality. It doesn't matter what chart we trade, it doesn't matter what we show you, it doesn't matter what lines we show you on the screens. When we look at uh, the oil, for example, a classic example on oil today, if I ask you what was your trade at the cash open on oil, we're obviously coming from a blue marketplace. Take a look at oil today. This is oil with our value narrative in the background. So if we're looking at the cash open on oil, here we go, 13.55. I know that there's going to be a massive arrival of orders because 1,400 hours, as you know, on oil brings a massive arrival rate. We know that this is the biggest single concern for the market makers. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be very sensitive as to where the informed trader is here. Well, the informed trader is going to buy discounts and sell premiums. That's what informed traders do. They buy value, they sell value. They know what value is, well, so do we. So if I know for the trade here, if I know that the informed trader is going to be a buyer and it'd be very difficult for anybody to tell me otherwise, then I know that when the informed trader comes in here at 1400 hours, that this is a buy trade. It's a V0 level in a blue marketplace. No shit, Sherlock. We can see that the trade came from a 
brilliant little top edge here where you can see where we got the v equals greater than zero and that was in a divergent value here suggesting that there was a seller coming in at that stage and an informed seller at that as well so we can see the informed seller coming in there that drove the price back into this value narrative here back into the next v0 level and we know that this is going to be a massive arrival rate so this is exactly the price we want to deal at so when we know this is the price we want to deal at, we've now got a big target because we now know the last informed trader came in at 71.25 and I'm able to buy oil at 70 bucks 50. I've got about a 75 tick discount here. And with that 75 tick discount, we absolutely annihilate the top edge at $71.25. The value still suggests we've got a lot of upside room to go and off we go to the upside. And sure enough, if that's V0, and that's V0, and that's our measure. We've got a target price of $71.80. And today we reach $71.80 almost without blinking. $1,200 profit by the time we reach V0, $1,200. And obviously you can see that the price continued to develop and the value never dropped. The value stayed bullish and the same concept that we talked about earlier, this idea of drawing in these v zeros in a buyer's marketplace and the idea of drawing in v zeros you can see a nice opportunity to add another nice opportunity to add and then another break and then we head into the two sigma level which is now at 72 dollars and 70 cents we hit the two sigma level here and by then we've just gone from 70 dollars 50 to 72 dollars 80. two thousand three hundred dollars per contract as the crow flies and all of a sudden, again, the value starts to peel off again. And we use that as an exit price. These circles are exits. So you can see that that became the top tick price. In other words, we effectively bottomed the oil and top ticked the oil. Pretty good. Pretty good indeed. And we can spot these elements, though, can't we? We can see, for example, that even into this top edge here, if we understand that when we come into this top edge here, we can simply carry on doing this as an idea. If I draw, join the dots, and it doesn't matter where you go, if I join the dots, you can see where we're roughly in the right location in terms of these V0s with the value dropping out. We know that these are important prices, and you can see why we don't quite reach v, v equals one in these areas. It turns into effectively V equals zero because the velocity's gone out the marketplace. We've decelerated. Why are we decelerating? Time of the day, 1600 hours, Brent market closing. The market's already developed a massive upside. But until that deceleration takes place, you still have all of these V0 buy opportunities. Another set of V0 buy opportunities there. Look, V0 buys here, V0 buys here, V0 buys in here. Lots of opportunities to keep plugging away to reach that two signal level. So we can understand this. We start to get a little bit better at uh, getting in front of the marketplace, but we can still trade the breakout of the marketplace. We don't have to be the guy that predicts everything. We don't have to be the guy when we get started that we're gonna predict stuff. We just trade what we can see. We trade what is happening. We trade what developed. As traders, sometimes that's all we can do. We don't have a view of fair value. We don't have an idea of what fair value is telling us. But generally, as a rule, even trading the breakouts, just the breakouts without knowing whether there's a bid or an offer, can allow us a measure. When we trade bonds, for example, it's buy side above, sell side below. So when the market goes red, we sell it. When the market goes blue, we buy it. And you can see that this market chopped around, but when it goes red, we sell it. When it goes blue, we buy it, and we can always get a stop at break even in these trades. When it goes red here, we sell it, and when it goes blue here, we buy it. And that last buy trade went from half to up to nearly one and a half thousand dollars profit on the buy side. Simple systematic trades. Simple systematic trades that make money. The good news is, in these areas, we can do better than that. We can actually interact. We can start planning, we can start figuring out into these areas whether this is indeed a buy order that's going to go in or a sell order. We can start interacting with the big guys, the big traders, the big dogs. We can calculate whether as market makers, 
we are going to recognize this as the high probability that there's an informed buyer or an informed seller showing up at this price point. If we know that there's a high probability that they're a buyer or a seller, we can pull the price according. We can move our ideas according to what is happening. We are no longer just a victim of that narrative. We can deal in and around those price points. Same is true of every marketplace. The same is true of every time we reach one of these informed trader levels. So when we are inside of a box level, we can try and figure out whether the informed trader is a buyer or a seller. When we are at a wholesale price level, is the informed trader a buyer or seller? If we look at the Forex markets like the pound, this is on a one minute chart here, you can see that this is our value narrative. Well, when we come up into this wholesale price level, I don't think anybody would look at that price level and say, I'm definitely going to be a buyer. So we know that the volume probability of informed selling coming in at that price is very high, very high indeed. And sure enough, it drops off beautifully. When we come into this area here, which is one of our box trade areas, we can see that the value has changed completely round. So when we find a V0 level in here, and there is a V0 starts to form here, there's a few V0s in the background, there's a V0 at that price. When we find some V0s in this area and the value pops hard to the upside, the chances of this being an informed seller is zero, pretty close. Well, if it's almost a zero in terms of an informed seller, then it's almost in the high 90s that this volume that comes in here, this massive increase in volume there at 1550 is an informed buyer. Well, if we know that that's going to be an informed buyer, what is the market maker response to that going to be? It's going to create a toxic buy candle that moves away from this price level. And we know that before it happens. We know it there, before that blue candle there, and before that blue candle there. Might not be the biggest trade in the world, but it's again an incredibly safe trade. This idea of knowing, this idea of having this knowledge before it takes place, allowing us to be in the trade not after these big candles take place and then paying stupid dumbass retail prices for stuff, but actually using the same game plan, using the same playbook as the market makers. Imagine being on the Ravens defense and they take on the Miami Dolphins, the best offense in the country. I'll get a few boos for that one. But imagine taking on the Miami Dolphins, the best offense in the country and the Ravens have the Dolphins playbook. They have access to every play, they have access to every signal. And when they see the signal, they're able to then take full advantage of that informed positioning of their players. If you've got access to that playbook, you're almost invincible. You know exactly what they're going to do. You know exactly what their plays are going to be. You know exactly how they're going to set up the play. You know exactly when they're going to set up in certain places on the field. Certain plays are reserved for the red zone, as you know. So if we can understand that that is also possible, inside of the likes of the Forex markets, you can see it for yourself. I don't have to make anything up. You can spot it for yourself. You can draw in the V lines. You can draw in V equals one there, and you can see that it's exactly the same price here as the V equals zero line there. Confluence. The perfect confluence. And when you look at the volume that came in there, you'll see this massive increase. The massive arrival of volume. Is that massive arrival of volume bearish or bullish or neutral? Well, when you look at the relative value, there's only one answer that I can come up with. The massive arrival of volume is incredibly bullish. And if I know that that's the case, my job now is to lean on that volume and become a buyer of the cable market. Get long into the storyline off of these very important, very key levels. The takeaway from that trade was pretty good. 2620s traded a high price of 2650 again, and we make ourselves another 30 pips. It's a one minute chart. It takes 30 minutes to make 30 pips, but guess what? We bottom ticked cable and we top ticked cable. There's nobody else got any better than 30 pips on that trade.
you basically were the best trader in the world, bar none, on that particular play. And you can see that we would have had two of those trades because that's just as good as a sell. It's just as good as this one here as a buy. We can recognize the use of the wholesale price levels. We can recognize the use of boxes, the brackets, the ideas. We can recognize that we could easily get into this before the toxicity kicks in, which is great news for all those people that find it difficult to buy when the price is already screaming away from them. And every time they buy, guess what happens? Where do most retail traders buy here? Where do the most retails buy in this trade? Well, they wait for the breakout, and by the time they wait for the breakout, and then they press the button, the price most retail traders get filled at is that price there, isn't it? It's that price there. And then the first thing that happens is the price drops against them because they got a bad fill. They're immediately then underwater, and they immediately say, oh, damn it, I'm going to have to take a loss. And they, they take a loss. And even if they don't take the loss, when the price moves into profit, they now thank the lucky stars that they got their money back. They promised whatever God they believe in. They'll never do it again. And they close out their trade here for break even before the price then continues in the direction. And now they're cursing their lucky stars a second time. They say, bloody hell, I'm damned if I do it. I'm damned if I don't at this stage because you overpaid the price. The psychological damage that these kinds of trades can do can obviously destroy any retail trader. It can just destroy any professional trader when you get into that type of cycle. So if you recognize your own trading in this, if you recognize the idea that you would normally be that buyer and the price immediately goes against you, it's because you're hitting the market too late. You're coming in after confirmation, after confirmation, after confirmation. What we try and teach you is to trade the same way as the market maker, to know what the market maker is about to do, not what they've done. But what they're about to do because of the arrival of informed trading, and why is the arrival of informed trading important? Because it's the single most important reason why market makers shift liquidity. We started out by looking at this little drawing of the guy at Goldman Sachs, and we asked the question, if this guy at Goldman Sachs is buying or selling, what's the market going to do about it? We talked about the Nash equilibrium. We talked about this idea that when we see the Nash equilibrium, if we know that the Nash equilibrium is selling, the market will stay selling. That's the same as the Newton's theory, law number two. Once in motion, it's going to keep going in motion until somebody decides to act upon it. The pressure, the acceleration is zero, but the velocity is still high. Acceleration is not the same as velocity. A lot of people make that mistake from physics, but it's not the same. Acceleration is that change in velocity. So when V equals one in simple, simple terms, the idea is V will stay equaling one until there's a reason why it shouldn't. And that agrees with the Nash equilibrium concept from game theory. If you don't have an informed trader making an informed choice to change the box, which takes us to the Monty Hall decision, the Monty Hall problem. If that decision is to stay with this, the same box, but we know that the informed traders are doing something different and they've opened a box for us. Well, it's up to us to now say, well, we know that it's going to change. We know, we've got to change our box here. This is selling off the V equals zero here, the V equals zero and the V equals one and the drop here. So we've got a V equals zero and a V equals one. So obviously on the basis that that's the case, this market should keep dropping. But we know that the box has been switched. The informed trader has opened a box for us to reveal a zero. There's nothing in that box, which just changes our probability that this V zero, this V equals one, is going to change. And we switch. We switch our boxes. And we suddenly go from a 33% probability to a 66% probability just by switching. 66% probability at a bottom edge. And that's just a 66% probability by recognizing the switch. We've got far bigger, higher probabilities when we start recognizing some of the tape, some of the order flow, some of the other tools that we've got access to in these price areas. 
So when we think about this, we'll obviously do the market makers game when we come into this trade idea on Monday. Obviously, we'll spend some time thinking about this process. But I want to just ask the final question again when we look at this market makers trade here. If you can recognize that this looks like it's a smart money buyer coming in here. And this is on trading view, of course. And uh, we can recognize that this is uh, not necessarily anything to do with order flow. But what do you think the smart money was doing at that stage? At that point, do you think there was any signs of any arrival rates? Well, we told you about the idea of the pink line, the smart money. Take a look at the same trade on the 6B contract here. You can see the smart money is bullish. The smart money is buying on this drop. We also suggested that there should be an arrival rate taking place. A yellow dot or a, or a pink dot should appear in this area in real time. And we look for whether that arrival rate showed up. And my goodness, all of a sudden we get a yellow dot. And at the same time as we get a yellow dot, the pink line is going back up again. We're starting to see that arrival rate showing up. And again, we can recognize that just putting a buy stop order in above that yellow dot allows me now to take advantage of an arrival rate that we can determine has an incredibly high V pin attached to it. The volume probability of informed traders, but the volume and value probability of informed traders is now established because we established that there's a reason for this to come in in the first place. And the reason why is on that chart there. The reason why is quite clearly visible. It's the same bloody trade. So if I can dedicate my trading every day to finding that opportunity, the opportunity where everything ties in that benchmarkable quality trade, and I can focus on those types of trades, and I always have a massive edge in the marketplace, well, that's surely got to be the secret to trading. So if you agree with me at the beginning of today's session, if you agree with me that the most important position is knowing what the market maker's position is, the most important position is knowing whether the market is worried, the most important position is understanding that the market maker's volume profile in terms of what they believe they should be in against what is actually available for them is the most important. In other words, do they want to accumulate a long position down here? Do they want to accumulate? Well, according to this, they did accumulate. According to this trade, they did accumulate. This is the volume delta. Look at the size of the volume delta. There is an enormous number of sell side orders here. The market maker must have been massively bullish. So the market maker must have been delighted to accumulate all that selling thousands and thousands of contracts of selling. And in hindsight, they were right to do that. In hindsight, they were correct to accumulate that because you can see the price went up and they made a lot of monies. So if we know that they're right to do something and we can verify that that's what they're doing, the probability of us hitting a winning trade is incredibly high, incredibly high. We take screenshot after screenshot after screenshot of these types of trades. We take idea after idea of these trades and, you know, we post them on our Twitter. We show everybody the ideas of what we're doing. We try and get people into these and we start verifying these trades from things like the trade log, which is what's been on in the background here. We start looking into some of these trade areas and verify whether we believe what we're seeing is an informed trade that's showing up. We have the tools, we have the technologies, we have the knowledge to get these trades done. Well, obviously, if you decide that this is something that's of interest, if you decide that this is the market truth, and you decide that 2024 is the year that the market truth should dominate your thinking, the idea that knowing that this is a buy trade with a very high degree of certainty, I'm 100% certain that this is a buy trade. Things can change. We could get a news release, we could get a sound bite that comes out that changes everything. That doesn't matter. There's nothing you can do about those things. But unless this changes, unless something dramatic changes, I have 100% certain that this is going to be a buy trade. No question, no ifs, no buts, no 
any other changes, I am going to be buying this somehow in this area. And the takeaway from that trade is glorious. If we can find that trade more often than not, we will be successful as traders in 2024. This is the key. Recognizing the difference between informed trading and not informed trading. This idea that when price comes into this area, is this an informed buyer? Or is it an informed seller? The idea that simply by recognizing this, this is important. The idea that where the market is in terms of the bias can give us some insight. If the market is buy side, if the market is blue or green, then of course the informed traders are probably going to be buy side market. If the market is heavy red, the informed traders are probably short and making money on the short sale. So we want to go with that as much as possible. In Monday's webinar, which we'll obviously do again, it's a free webinar. We will be the market maker. We will get you to think about, you will be the market maker. We'll get you to think about the market making process, open up a demo account on whatever platform you're using. And we'll start thinking about this idea, this idea of the V equals one and the V equals zero levels. We'll give you some rules to market make with, but we'll start developing a feeling. And if you start to be the market maker, if you start to sense what you think you should be doing, you're going to start making some incredible breakthroughs. If you're told to be a buyer and you're looking at it saying, I hate this idea of buying this, well, guess what you're probably going to do? What would you do? I would pull, I would pull away my liquidity. Well, guess what's likely to happen? They're likely to pull away their liquidity. You start to get that knowledge, that breakthrough knowledge that you are going to do exactly what the market maker was taught to do himself. That knowledge is going to save you a fortune. It's going to make you a fortune by simply then being able to map out exactly what the market maker should be doing in every single one of these areas, in every single case. To do that, we've got to get into the head of the market maker. We've got to re-engineer, reverse engineer, deconstruct the market maker model. That's what the class is going to be next week. And that's what the webinar is going to be on Monday is we're going to be that market maker. And then when we get into the class proper, we're going to start adding those other elements, those other things that start helping us to determine whether that market maker model has VPN arriving in its favor or VPN arriving against us. And what would you do as a market maker to avoid suffering? It's not me telling you this. It's not me that's telling you that this is important. It's the New York Fed. We've already seen the paper. They mention arrival rate 47 times in that one single staff paper. Arrival rate, how that it's the most important decision that they need to get right. Arrival rates. We've seen from VPIN papers, uh, from Goldman Sachs, from JP Morgan staffers, that these are the most important single issues for liquidity in the world. If these are the most important issues talked by the most important banks and the most important institutions, you are needing to know this for 2024 if you don't already know. So come along on Monday and we'll obviously go through the market makers exercise. Same time, same place. I'm going to finish off with that. I hope there was something of interest in this, but you'll get a lot more from Monday's classroom. We had to go through the basic background to this initially. So you understood what we're going to be doing. And then on Monday, we will get into the exercise proper where we'll start being the market maker. So make sure you've got a demo account open on whatever platform. We will be running up big positions depending upon how the market plays out. We will run from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock to the closing bell. And we'll start discussing what the market makers feelings, what they would be doing, how you would be reacting to those ideas in the classroom from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock on Monday. So please come along. You might just learn something that you haven't seen before from the market maker's perspective. Enjoy. I'm going to see in the meantime. Adios. And for the meantime, ciao for now. Thanks very much for turning up, guys. Cheers, bye. Thank you so much, Ray. Yes, yes. Thank you, Peter. It is good to have Ray. And we wanted to kick off the, the new year a little different. So we appreciate you guys. And yes, as you know, I'm going to give you guys some insight into what we're going to be doing in this the art of scalping. So 
We appreciate you being here with us today. And if you have any questions, I will be the one to answer them. But I bet you're sitting there thinking, oh, no, she's going to be trying to sell me something really, really, really expensive. Guess what? We're going to do this workshop. Ray wants to get you kicked off on the right um, with the right foot getting uh, going with your trading. So we're going to get started here. Let me just get this moved over so that you guys we've got it in the right place. Oh, I went too far. Can you guys believe it? If you sign up today, this event special, $97. So next week, we're going to have three days live in the market. Just what he was doing today, only going deeper in these, getting with the strategies, working on the probabilities. And we'll get moving uh, from that. It's $97. That's going to be the special. Regular is going to be $297. So it's going to save you some money. Plus, plus because we're doing this kind of get you started um, we'll have some bonus sessions for you to get started some of our most watched most recommended I should say uh, sessions that our traders say all traders should should know so we definitely want you to go to compassfx.com forward slash three day and we'll get you started Give a big round of applause too for Ray. Wish I had our, we used to have our, I, I could come up with the noises, right? When we were over in the other room, we had our little sound machine. And Jackie, no worries if you're going to be out of town because they, all the sessions are going to be recorded. We are going to also, some of you guys were asking about our, um, you know, the tools and the resources that our traders use that Ray was showing. We're going to have a whole session, um, you know, with uh, uh, David, who does the order flow suite. We've got Greg, who handles the stuff on our trading view uh, tools. I haven't even had a chance to ask him if he'll be available next Thursday. Fingers crossed that he will. But we're going to do those each afternoon. Tuesday and Wednesday will be Ray at 3 o'clock. Thursday will be uh, the tech session. And Friday will be Ray um, at 3 o'clock. All sessions, all four days are going to be um, at 3 o'clock. They'll all be recorded. So then you can go back and study. Plus, as you uh, come in um, now and early, taking that, getting that event special pricing. So for those of you guys that were saying, um, yes, you know, from Hubert, he said, hey, could you do something reasonable for our guys? He really thought that you guys might, um, you know, really find value with what Ray's teaching on the order flow going really, you know, deeper um, into this and the market maker math teaching how to, you know, price the market and the probabilities. So I think it ties in great with um, the tools and stuff you're already using, the teachings that you have, you'll find from Ray, he's gonna just give you that why behind some of the things you're already doing that you might go, oh, you know what? That's gonna be that little key that really unlocks more for me. So I think you'll find the, uh, the, the sessions with Ray as he lays it out, the intern exercise, is really valuable. You're going to find the market maker math. Um, you're going to find the you know order flow as he's going in, you know pricing uh, the market and learning you know what all of these things so that you actually know. You know I think when we first started working with Ray, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so different. It really came down to the why, not just the how. And as Ray always says with indicators, you know you should be using an indicator because you know what you're wanting to see, not just the opposite. I think a lot of times as uh, in the retail space, we find that we're using uh, tools and stuff because we think they know, the tool knows something we don't, that they're smarter. And 
race kind of flips that around and says, know what you're looking for so that you can make the, the tool, you know, your best weapon and it helps you sharpen those edges. Otherwise it's like that 50, 50 game. You know what it is. You, you've got all everything in place. You do it today. It works great. Your checklist is all in order tomorrow. You do the exact same thing. Everything looks the same and it doesn't work. And then what do we do? We start questioning ourselves. What did I miss? What did I miss? Probably didn't miss anything. It was just that you didn't have enough information. As Ray was saying, the informed part is the most important um, aspect in your trading to really nail down and master. So that's why we wanted to kick this off so you can get started compassfx.com forward slash three day pretty simple ninety seven dollars will get you started and we'll be able to get you rolling from there we are going to have sessions next week and oh like ninety seven dollars how about that that'll get you started for we will get you started right there so get in line Let's get this special. Save yourself A, some money. We know that's always a good thing. And, you know, you may be saying, like, well, who's this for? You know, it's going to be perfect for, especially so many of you guys are working on the funded accounts. I used to be, you know, I'm just being honest out there. I used to not really uh, think that these accounts, I thought, you know, they were just selling hope subscriptions, you know, for trading because there really wasn't that. And I've really sat back and thought about we have a number of our traders in our group that are using these, uh, you know, the challenges and the funded accounts with, you know, what Ray's uh, teaching and many are doing uh, well with those. But I think there's a good stepping stone, you know, before with so many people saying, oh, I've already went through so much money you know trying to trade and all of that it gives you that bridge of using you know other people's money test your skills before you you know really start building so if you're working on the um, evaluation tests the funded accounts I think these uh, tools for really you know digging in diving deeper for $97 I think you can't um, miss there you know, if you're wanting to improve your consistency and profits, how do you do that? By actually, you know, knowing your what your edge is and the probabilities, being able to do the math, then you can, you know, actually quantify, you know, the, and have a predictable outcome. So I think it helps in that way. Improve your execution skills. You know, a number of our traders really talk about, you know, how much just having these, um, you know, uh, exercises and stuff to really prove where they are and master what they need to, to be able to get those exercises, you know, because Ray's whole um, premise for everything he teaches, you know, we've got structure, value, volume at price. So you've always want to be in a position where you're getting a discount. So as you um, you know, get started that you put yourself in a position so you're not always climbing out of a hole. You know, when you're paying up for price, what ends up happening? Then as it comes back, because you don't know where you are in the auctions uh, cycle, then it comes back, it tests your resolve and you end up getting out of a trade only to watch it turn around and go in the direction that you'd already planned on it was really just came down to pricing. One of the first things that we uh, learned when Ray came in, and I loved that, is being able to see, you know, if you're going to be a buyer, do you have buyers above you? Because if you don't have buyers above you, then, you know, you're buying too soon, too early. So being able to know where you are in those cycles and in the process is going to really help you, you know, and, you know, Ray being able to, you know, help you learn to define those edges and, you know, until you get to that point where you're making some of those decisions to be able to use systematic strategies, but systematic strategies that you actually know how to have a predictable outcome, you know, with those uh, probabilities. So until then he gives you steps and layers 
um, within those strategies, um, you know, to help you and get defined stops. So I think that's, um, I think for what we're going to do during those uh, days, I think it's going to be really, really beneficial. I think it's going to be super valuable. It's going to be a great way to kick off uh, the new year. Just $97 it gives you three days plus the bonus day. And the guys really go into the tools that we use. Like I said, all of the tools that we have are the reason that they're different is that these are students and traders in our group that have made these tools based around lessons that Ray has taught the classes. So it, uh, you know, will be able to help you uh, get in there uh, to get those edges. Let's see, someone's saying that um, they're not seeing the offer. Are you guys not? I'll Because I've been kind of working through the, the slides, so I want to make sure. Hey, Stan. And so, Oleg, yes, the $97. Oh, you know what, Oleg? If you do your um, monthly subscription, it would be included in that. So, sorry, I wasn't catching what you were uh, saying. Ho hopefully, as I've uh, gone through here, sorry, guys, I had someone saying that it wasn't showing uh, the slides of, you know, of the price and what you get. Like I said, you'll have the three days with um, the live scalping strategies, the market maker math, and then you'll have um, an order flow technical session and, you know, with our trading view tools as well. So you get all of that for $97 and we have some of our, you know, most watched and as a bonus. So you can actually get started today. Some of these things that Ray was talking about, instead of wait until next week, it's just Wednesday. We're going to be coming up on a weekend. You can take advantage, get a great price, $97. Can't even go to the movie anymore <laughs> for that, right? So you can have hours of of sessions. You can uh, go on a real Rayathon and get yourself started. So hopefully that will help on that. I'll go back to this slide so you can see the dates. It's January 9th through the 12th next week at uh, each day at 3 p.m. Just $97. And, and the we'll be going through all of the other um, different offers and all of that. I'm going to stop the recording because I don't think we need to go through that part if we're just answering questions, right? So I want to, hey, real quick, give a big shout out to you guys for joining us. A big thank you to Ray for coming in. I'm going to answer all the questions, but start next week. You can get signed up today for just $97 and you'll get instant access well it might take like 15 minutes I don't even know if it takes that long but you'll get access right away you can start working on your skills <laughs>